Hello and welcome to Connecting with Student Accessibility Services with a focus on course selection. Uh, my name is Tanya Green and I'm an advisor here at Student Accessibility Services and I'm so happy that you're joining me this afternoon to talk a little bit about what SAS is and how we provide supports to students. But we're going to also focus a lot on the course selection, which is what is going to be coming up for you uh, in the next few weeks. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there is, you will see the question and answer um, opp uh, place opportunity on the uh, on the side there. So if you do have any questions um, as we go along, feel free to pop those into that chat and um, we will answer it. I have uh, a fantastic team behind me today um, who will be able to answer those questions as we go along. Also, there, if there are some questions that need to be answered live during the presentation, uh, Nicole may interrupt me partway through. Uh, so some questions will be a bit of a discussion, um, but others you'll be able to access um, through, uh, through the question and answer tab. So to get started today, just to kind of give you an overview of what we're going to do, um, we are going to take a look at what is SAS? Uh, how do you register with our office? This isn't the main focus of this particular session. We do offer um, our connecting with SAS question and answer sessions, uh, with the first one being next Thursday um, throughout July and August. So if you do have questions specific to documentation, registering, accommodations, meeting your advisor, those sort of things, you can um, connect to one of those sessions. Um, and uh, maybe I'll get one of my team to pop the uh, summer events um, link into the uh, into the chat so that you can access those um, if you do have any um, questions at that point. Our main focus today and hopefully where we'll spend most of our time is talking about what to consider when it comes to course selection. So when you're registered with SAS, what might you want to keep in mind? So things like reduced course loads, part-time, full-time studies. So we want to make sure we're addressing some of those issues, how that impacts tuition. Um, and then also where you can go to get more help if you have more questions and resources that are available to you. So that's where we're planning to go. So first, what is SAS? So SAS assists in addressing the structural barriers when a disability is affecting a student's functioning. So before I elaborate on that, I just want to have a, a make a quick comment on the language. We know that sometimes uh, people aren't comfortable comfortable with the term disability, but we're using it in, ter in the legal sense of the term. Um, so it means that there's something going on with the person in terms of the in terms of their health or the way that they learn that may affect, affect them in their academics. Um, and, it's, and it presents some barriers and it's therefore appropriate to provide that person with some academic accommodations and some supports, right? So essentially the short answer is when there's a barrier um, that is in place due to a disability or um, and it impacts the, the student's functioning. We look at things like how the courses are set up. We look at academic policy um, and how their disability might be infer interfering with the, the job of being a student. So getting to class, learning in class, following the policies and procedures of the university and those, and those structures. So that's where we're able to um, provide assistance. Determine and help to arrange academic accommodations. So it's a large part of our role is connecting with students and discussing the, what accommodations are appropriate for their, their given course um, and their particular needs. We work closely with students and instructors. Oops. We work closely with students and instructors to collaboratively, um, collaboratively to determine what is needed. So um, in this case, what we're doing is for many new students, it may feel a little different from high school because we're not going to just decide what accommodations you need and tell you what you're going to get. Um, but we discuss this with you um, and it's based on your documentation. It's based on what your concerns are, what's worked for you in the past. 
We might not be able to duplicate the accommodations you've received in the past, but we'll talk with you about other ways that we can help and what we can do um, to, to manage the symptoms of your disability. Uh, accommodations are based on you and your unique disability needs and the course demands. So accommodations will vary based on the disability needs and the course demands. So we look at both those factors. Um, we'll sometimes have students that will have friends getting one thing and they'll be like, my friend gets this. And we say, well, we're looking at your specific situation and what's going to be appropriate for you. One of the key things to remember when we do put accommodations in place is that with accommodations, we do not change the academic requirements of a course for your degree. Okay? You're going to be meeting the same requirements as an SAS student as a non-SAS student. So there are some accommodations that we can't put in place because that would change the requirement of the course. Um, and that's not what we're here to do. We don't provide modifications. We don't modify the expectations of the course. You're still required to do the same work. Um, it just may look a little different than, um, than other students. At the end of the day, when you've completed your degree, you're going to graduate with a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Commerce. Nowhere is it going to say Bachelor of Arts with accommodations. Nowhere in your transcript is it going to say what I used extra time for tests. None of that information is um, shared with anyone. The and for that reason, you still need to make sure that that degree that you're receiving, you've met the same requirements as everybody else who is receiving that that same degree. Some of the disability groups that we support um, are students with ADHD, ASD, chronic illnesses, concussions, injuries, learning disabilities, mental health uh, concerns, mobility and dexterity, perceptual disabilities, and temporary disabilities. If you're not sure, um, you can complete um, our SAS application and still connect with our office um, and we'll be able to direct you appropriately. The steps in registering with SAS. So in order to access accommodations, and I'm hoping that many of you have already done this, but the SAS um, application um, starts, it's the first step, right? It's available online, so you can definitely reach out to connect, uh, reach out to the student portal, you fill out that application, that lets us know that you are a student and are interested in connecting with our services. Um, how will you know if, you've if we've received it? You do get a confirmation email once you've completed the application to say um, that it's received. The second step is submitting your documentation. Um, submitting your documentation, you upload your documentation to the site. A lot of times students will do step one and two at the same time because it's all sort of within the same page in um, the student application. And uh, so you can upload that documentation, whether it's a functional assessment, whether it's a psych ed report. Um, if you're interested in what the guidelines for our documentation is, you can definitely check out our website and um, there will be there's links I'll get the <laughs> ladies to put the links in the chat to um, our documentation guidelines and uh, so you know what what is needed from that sense. As I said, many of you may have already done these steps and have already um, submitted this information and that's fantastic. If you haven't or you're considering it, um, that would be something that you want to make sure you uh, look into. Um, third step. What is our orientation? So attending an orientation, um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, are connecting with SAS sessions that take place in the um, throughout July and August. So you can definitely connect to that. We'll get you some information about about SAS and how we work. But in the end of August, so August 31st and September 1st, the Thursday, Friday, right before Labor Day is our start accessible 
um, orientation program. So it's a two day in person event where you get to come to campus, learn a little bit more about um, about SAS, um, all of the services that we provide, the assistance we provide, how to access our services. You know, many of you will be using things like extra time on tests or writing in a quiet space and how to how to access those is really crucial to um, being able to to use those accommodations. So definitely attending that orientation. You will get more information about that. So make sure you watch your U of G email um, about uh, letting us know if you're planning to attend um, Start Accessible. Because it does happen before Labor Day, those students who are participating in Start Accessible will have the opportunity to move in early. So you can definitely um, get a chance to get comfortable with campus, feel a little bit more at ease where with everything is. Um, we do have a quick SAS tour that shows you all of um, our services, and so that's uh, important to consider as well. And then that third step is meet, or that fourth step <laughs> is meeting with your now, these two steps, the orientation and the meeting with your advisor might be flipped because some of you may be meeting your advisor um, in August and others of you might be meeting your advisor later into uh, September. Either one is fine as long as you connect with your advisor because that's when your accommodations are going to be determined. That's when those are going to all be laid out. So you'll know exactly what your accommodations look like and um, how to access them. Well, you'll learn how to access them at the orientation. Um, so it's important to uh, attend attend that. So um, you have that information as well. Okay. Finding out who your advisor is. You'll find out who your advisor is again through an email. Usually it comes out the in early August. Once you get that information, you'll be um, asked to contact SAS to book an appointment um, with your advisor, recognizing that advisor's availability is different throughout the summer. Um, so you, you may need to wait a couple of weeks before you um, get that initial appointment. And that's fine um, as long as uh, we're doing it early into um, the school year. Okay. The other thing to remember is you do want to make sure you reach out every semester because your courses are your accommodations are linked to your courses. So when your courses change, which they will each semester, your accommodations need to be linked up to those. So it's a good idea to keep in mind at the beginning of every semester. I just need to go into uh, connect with SAS and remind them that I'm here and that I want to access those accommodations. There's a lot of reasons why students may not use their accommodations in a given semester, and uh, so that's why it's important to to reach out and connect early. Once all these steps are completed, then you will be able to access um, student accessibility services. You'll be able to access your accommodations. So the order of them. Maybe not necessarily as crucial, but making sure that all four of those are done um, will help to guide your way to a successful, successful first semester. I just want to check if there's any questions. And then I will review again. Um, Tanya, there are some questions about some people being unable to view the live. Um, you might just have to repeat uh, those steps again. Repeat the steps again? Okay. Yeah. So are they having a hard time hearing me or just seeing the event? Um, unable to view the session, it said. Oh. Okay. Well, I will go over, I'll go over that really quickly. The just so that everyone knows, this is going to be recorded and it will be on the um, Start U of G website, so they'll be able to access it there. But those steps in, review, in um, accessing as the registering with SAS are completing the SAS application, which you do online. Step two is submitting the documentation. Uh, and you do that online as well. You can do both those steps together. The, and then attending an orientation and meeting your advisor may happen in that order or the reverse order, but it is important to make sure you access the or attend the orientation so you get those that general information about 
how to access your supports and your services, as well as um, meeting with your advisor where you get your own individual accommodations. The other thing to just uh, remember as well is your accommodations are linked to your courses. And because we're talking about course selection today, as each course is, um, each semester your courses change, your, um, your accommodations need to be linked up to those courses. So every semester you will want to make sure that at the start of the term you reach out to your advisor and you actually log in and request those accommodations. Um, Tanya, there's another, yeah. sorry, there's another sure, question. No. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a deadline to register with SAS? There, so in order to access accommodations for the fall, it's important to register or to submit that application and your documentation by June 15th. I realize that's in only a couple of days, um, but that gives us enough lead time to make sure that um, we can have everything in place for the start of the semester. Completing that SAS application lets us know that you're a student out there, you're thinking that you want to be able to access services and, and connect with us, and then it allows us to also reach out to you. So the sooner you do it, the better. However, if you can register throughout the summer, if you're connecting with us for the first time at the end of August or early September, we might not be able to get those accommodations in place right away. There's going to be a little bit of a delay. So the sooner you do it, the better. Um, and there's yeah. just one other yeah. question. Sorry, Tanya. Um, you talked about students getting their degree um, and it not saying that um, they were registered with SAS, but some uh, want to know if their accommodations will show up on their transcript. They will not. Nowhere will it indicate that they were that the student was registered with uh, with SAS or that they received accommodation. So accommodations do not appear on your transcript. They don't appear on your degree. Um, everything that you connect with us about remains confidential. Faculty will know your accommodations if they need to put anything in place. So, for instance, if you require extra time for a test. Um, and the professor needs to provide that to sort of an online examination, they will know that that is what you are receiving. They will not know the nature of your disability or why you are receiving that accommodation, um, but that's why we work closely with them around this is the support that is needed, um, but nowhere does it indicate that you received any support. That was a good question. Anything else before I move on? Okay, keep the questions coming. So for our next little section, this is where we start talking about course selection, right? So course selection, um, I just want to remind everyone that the All About Course Selection session through um, U of G Start is happening at 4 p.m. today. So we'll, when we wrap up, you'll have a little bit of a break, and then that's where you're going to learn how to use WebAdvisor, how to access student planning, map out your courses, understand the actual how-tos of doing your course selection, um, guidelines on what courses to take based on your program, that sort of information is all going to be provided in that session. So that's that general session. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk about some things to keep in mind and some considerations when you are listening to that session. Um, and so you can kind of come back and, and think about what, what's going to work for you and then do some follow up with either your advisor or your program counselor, depending on the nature of, of those needs. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is our reduced, a reduced course load. So a reduced course load is something that many students don't realize that a reduced course load is even possible, even allowed. Um, what we want SAS students to do is when they're coming into their first year is to consider the idea of a reduced course load, right? At the session you're going to be going to and a lot of the publications you hear from the universities go on the assumption that you're taking five courses in a semester over two, sem two semesters a year and this would be considered 100% of a full course load is five courses. And that's what, again, typically comes out, right? 
that would mean that if you do five courses in the fall semester, five courses in the winter semester, three years would it would take to do a general program, four years to do an honors degree. Okay? What I'm telling you is hardly anybody does that. <laughs> it's not something that happens whether you're registered with SAS or not registered with SAS. Most people do not do that. Um, and follow that, that process. There's so many options and availability around that. And there's a lot of, there's many, many good reasons why students don't take 100% course load. Right? So it is something to consider. It could be for disability related reasons. Sometimes it could be for varsity athletes. Sometimes it has to do with um, social or um, other volunteer programs or um, co-ops or internships, other things that, that students are doing on why they might not be taking 100%. And as I said, most people don't do it, so it is something to definitely consider. However, the communications you're going to see are going to be based on those five courses over three or four years. What the reduced course load helps is it we encourage the SAS students to consider doing that reduced course load because it also helps with that adjustment to university, right? A reduced course load can create more space and time to adjust to those challenges of learning at university. In some cases, we say adjusting to university, that transition is a course in itself. All the things that you need to learn and change and adjust. So, and with SAS students, there's also that different level of processes and understandings that something that they need to consider and things like how to access their accommodations, how to book exams in the exam center, where to write, the extra time it may take them to go through course material, to learn the course material. So again, things to consider and a full course load may look different for different people depending on how much time it takes. Um, sometimes students will just need to take a semester off, right? Depending on how things are going, you may need to say, I'm just going to take the winter semester off and readjust, think about your physical and mental well-being and what needs to happen in order for you to continue with your academics. The university, as Fiona pointed out, is structured on a three-semester plan, timetable, three semesters. It's a little different than high school where you had one semester, two semesters, and then your summer was two months. Each semester is identical at the university, so they all follow a 12-week learning time with a two-week exam period, fall, winter, and summer. Right? So you can take those your courses in, um, I would say, any sequence that you prefer, but you can manage it that way. There's also no set time limit by which you must complete your degree, right? So you don't have to complete a degree in four years or three years. You can take as long or I guess as little time as you get to complete it, as long as you meet all those degree requirements. Any questions about doing a reduced course load? Yes, hi, Tanya. Um, there's a question. Um, so this question asks, do students need to speak with their SAS advisor to take a reduced course load? Generally, they don't, right? You do not need to check in with your, your SAS advisor about doing a reduced course load. Um, you may want to discuss it when you meet with your advisor and say, hey, I'm considering a reduced course load, and they can talk to you about what that might look like and um, how, to, how to manage that. Um, they may actually tell you to suggest or suggest you connect with your program counselor just to think about the timeline of things. So if, for instance, a course is only offered in the winter semester, that might be the semester that you want to take it because so you don't have to wait another full year before that course is offered again. So program counselors know those little bits of ins and outs, but if you choose to do a reduced course load, you can definitely discuss it with your um, advisor, but you don't need to do that before you make that decision. 
Awesome. There's another question. Um, this question asks if a student chooses to take a reduced course load, when do they pick up those courses? OK, so um, as I said, there's the three semesters, the fall, winter and the summer, and they all follow the same plan. So if students do four courses in the fall, four courses in the winter, they could pick up a course or two in the summer. Um, they can take um, as many semesters, as I mentioned, as many semesters as they need to complete their degree um, within reason. So I think like there, I want to say maybe a long time ago, there was like you had to finish your degree within 10 years, but I don't think there's a limit anymore on uh, how long it can take you to um, complete your degree. So once you take a course, it stays on your transcript. You'll always have that. and. Um, yeah, you can, like I said, you can pick those up in any subsequent semester. Okay. Um, Anything else? One, oh. Yeah, sorry, one other question. Yeah. Uh, this question asks, uh, if a student is in co-op, can they take a reduced course load? Yeah, good question. So for co-op, um, if you are a student and you're, you're doing co-op, you can take a reduced course load. It is something that um, we want to talk to your co-op coordinator about as well, because your um, academic terms and your work terms may be adjusted slightly depending on the number of courses and credits that you have as you progress through. The other thing to keep in mind is, as I said, sometimes there's certain courses that are offered in certain semesters, and you want to make sure that you're able to actually take those courses to continue on your degree path towards graduation. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a little bit of an adjustment, but yes, you can definitely take a reduced course load. Um, and we work with, uh, with co-op coordinators around that. Good. Anything else, Nicole, or are we good? Um, there are a couple questions asking about if students take a reduced course load, um, how does that affect their tuition payment? Oh, good question. That's actually going to go right into my next slide. Is there another question and I can hold off on that? Uh, no, you can hold off for now. OK. Is there one more or I can go on? You're good to go on, Tanya. OK, fantastic. So. That was a great segue <laughs> into my next slide. Um, so tuition adjustments. Question is, you take a reduced course load and then it's like, what about the money? Where, um, what does that mean? So non-SAS students taking 2.0 credits, so a reduced course load, pay full-time tuition fee. And that amount is equal to the cost for 2.5 credits. Now, I speak in credits versus courses because that's how the university looks at things and there are some courses that are worth more so they might be worth 1.0 credit or they might be worth 0 0.25 0 0.75 different values of the credit weighting for the courses um, that sometimes dependent on how much work's involved so if it's a full credit course 1.0 then there's probably ideally there or there should be twice as much work is the way it's mapped out if it's a little less if it's a 0.25 there's going to be a little less work or there's different different weighting for the amount of work that goes into those credit courses so from an adjustment perspective for tuition is if you are considered a full-time student so taking 2.0 credits or more then you are paying full-time student fees for students who are registered with SAS, and we've discussed it and talked about um, taking a reduced course load for disability related reasons, um, student taking 2.0 credits can request an, a, a tuition adjustment. They do that with their advisors. They connect with their advisor and say, yep, this is the, um, I want to do a, um, you'll, hear us, you'll hear us refer to it as a tuition release or a tuition waiver. And what happens is they will, only pay for the 2.0 credits that they are enrolled. So instead of paying the full-time tuition fee, they will be paying per credit um, for their tuition. 
So, and course loads of less than 2.0 credit are already charged by the credit. So if you're taking half a credit in the summer, you're only paying for half a credit. If you're taking 1.5 credits, again, you're only paying for 1.5 credits. Essentially, the way um, that reduced course load works with the tuition adjustments is your tuition is adjusted, so you're only paying for the credits that you're taking. Tanya, there's a question yeah. in the <laughs> chat. Um, I sorry. <laughs> um, a student asked, can students take major required courses during the summer? They can if they're offered. So course selection changes from um, semester to semester. Um, some courses, the summer semester, there, there's a lot of courses offered, not necessarily as many as in the fall and winter. We usually get about maybe 50 to 60% of the students are taking courses in the summer. Um, a number of students will actually take the summer off to work. That's kind of what, what yeah, but half the students will do that, but half the students will take courses. Um, and if a rate major requirement for your course is offered in the summer, then you can take it. That's where the program counselor comes into play because they'll know, they have a better idea of which courses are offered in the summer. Um, and it's a good strategy a lot of students will take as well is if there's a particular course that is harder for them, right? I know sometimes the stats class, the organic chem class, <laughs> there's a few classes that when they're offered in the summer, students might take that because they can focus all of their energy on that one course during one semester, rather than trying to balance a more challenging class with classes that, with, you know, three or four other classes. So, so the question, the answer to that is, it depends on the course offerings in the summer. But because we have about half the students, more than half the students taking courses in the summer, there's a lot of course offering. A lot of them are distance ed as well, so they're not actually on campus. They are um, done remotely. Their questions? Not at the moment. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so moving on. So looking at part-time versus full-time study. So we talked about the tuition adjustments, um, and I did mention being sort of a full-time student and full-time fee. So full-time students are students who are taking 2.0 credits or more. So then you're considered a full-time student. I don't always like the part-time, full-time student status because it can be really frustrating because it depends on who's asking and what you need it for. Um, on what that, that status means, right? So part-time and full-time studies is not something you apply for. It is just based on the number of credits you are taking. So some students will say, I don't want to be a part-time student. And I'm like, well, if you're taking one course in the summer, you're naturally a part-time student just by the nature of the number of courses you are. It doesn't impact your fall. It doesn't impact your winter. It doesn't impact other terms, right? So all it has to do with is that number. The university <laughs> bases your full-time, part-time status on the num on how much tuition you pay, right? So you're considered a full-time student if you're paying full-time fees, right? And that's tied to the number of courses you're taking for undergrad students. Graduate students, I'm not sure if we have graduate students out there, but if you're a graduate student, you can be taking one course and still be considered full-time paying full-time fees, right? So it really depends on how much money you're paying to the university to determine if you're full-time or part-time. OSAP, on the other hand, if you are a student who is applying for OSAP, um, OSAP has a slightly different definition for part-time, full-time fees, and OSAP will also consider if you are a student with a disability. So if you're a student with a disability, they will sort of change that full-time, part-time status. And in order to do that, there's additional forms that you have to have on file with financial services. Just something to point out, we are two different offices. So registering for, with us does not necessarily connect you with disability-related OSAP um, forms. There's sort of different forms 
to to tie with with OSAP if uh, different paperwork um, if you are looking to be registered with, with for disability with OSAP as well. Um, other sources may have their own definitions on what's considered part time and full time. Okay? What I find is important for students, or the most important thing, is to figure out how many courses works for you. Right? We recognize that sometimes students might be taking two courses, three two courses, and that's the equivalent of full time studies for them. They're putting in the amount of work it takes to have a full course load by doing, even though they are doing fewer courses. So it's about finding that magic number. What's the number of courses that work for you where you can manage your academics, you can still manage to sleep and to eat and to socialize and have relaxing time and do the other things that may are part of university, right? If all you do is come to university and study, you're not really getting the full benefit. So it's important to find that, that good balance. The other thing to keep in mind with full-time, part-time studies is if you are looking for a um, certificate of enrollment from enrollment services that says you're full-time or part-time, sometimes this is needed for things like RESPs. Um, the university is going to say you're part-time or full-time depending on the number of credits that you're taking. However, your SAS advisor may be able to write a letter that just outlines based on your disability is that taking a reduced course load is considered full time. So it's definitely important to, to connect and have those, those discussions um, with, your, with your advisor. Any questions on part time, full time studies? Hi, Tanya. There are yeah. a couple. So sure. the first one um, asks, do I have to be a full time student to live in residence? Oh, good question. You do not need to be a full time. Say, good idea to check with housing to confirm that, but generally you don't need to be a full time student living in residence. Um, if you are doing fewer than I think believe I believe three courses that but you're registered with SAS then they may just need confirmation from us really what housing is doing is they say you need to be full-time so that you're there to study right so students who might be taking one or two courses as long as you're not causing a disturbance and bothering everybody else while they're studying they have no problem with you being there. So it's just a matter of making sure that um, when you're living in residence that you're still, you're still studying and still an active student. Awesome, there is another question. Yeah. Um, this question asks, can I change between being a part-time and a full-time student? Yes, you can. Um, as I mentioned, it's not something that you have to apply for. It is, um, you are considered a part-time, full-time student based on the number of um, credits you are taking and uh, you're enrolled in. And so you may be a part-time student one semester and a full-time student the next semester. Um, it does impact how much you pay in tuition, but that also, uh, when you're a full-time student and you're paying full-time student fees, you have, there's, the drug plan that you have access to, um, and then there's things like bus passes, and there's other things you get for being a full-time student and paying those fees, that if you are considered a part-time student, that you may have to opt into. Any other questions on courses? Okay. So moving into our campus resources. So what you've probably heard is, I mean, we've talked a lot about, I've talked about different places that you can get help, financial services, program counselors. SAS is here to help. We're always happy to help, but sometimes that means sending you elsewhere. So sometimes we have to do those referrals. Um, there are a lot of specialists on campus. You'll find that everyone is knowledgeable, but we all have our areas of expertise. So referrals are part of our role to make sure you're getting the right information from the right source, right? 
part of your role is to include seeking out this information, right? So you might have to go to different places to get your answer, your question answered. Um, a little bit about like being a detective, um, but we're always here to help and to try and direct you in the, um, the right direction, right? So some places that we might be making referrals to your program counselors, you've heard me talk about that. The session today at four, we'll talk more about your program counselors and what their role is. So they help you with what courses to take, how to arrange your sequence, as I've mentioned, which order to take your classes in, especially if you're doing a reduced course load, where those fall, how that, that maps out. And it may mean that your degree takes five or six years to complete and how what that looks like. Dropping courses, you always have the option of dropping courses. You don't have to ask permission to drop a course. Um, sometimes it's better to drop a course. Well, it's always better to drop a course than it is to fail it. But sometimes it's better to drop a course early in the semester if you're feeling overwhelmed and you want to manage the, the fewer courses and you can be successful in those fewer courses, right? So you don't necessarily need to talk to anybody about it. But if you're worried about whether that course is going to be offered in the next semester or if it's going to throw off your sequence, you may want to check in with your program counselor about it. At the end of the day, if you end up failing the course, you'll have to repeat it, but that failed grade will appear on your transcript. So dropping courses, it's better to, to drop it than to have that failed grade. And switching majors, looking at changing between different majors within the same degree program or changing different degree programs, right? We sometimes get students coming in and they are interested in being a lawyer and so they go into criminology and then they realize, oh, maybe this isn't exactly what I want. I'm more interested in the psychological aspect of things and they want to switch to psychology. Program counselors can help you with switching your major and how those the courses that you're in will move into that new degree program. What's nice about university is you're getting a universal degree, so a lot of your courses will switch and fall into different programs, again, depending on where you're switching to. If you're in a philosophy program to start and you decide to switch to engineering, there might be a little less overlap in, in, those, different, in those two areas. But that's where your program counselor can come in and, and help you work through. Student financial services, great resource for things like OSAP, for funding, for tuition, all of those kind of um, issues, definitely reaching out there. If you've had a chance to be on campus or to explore the website, you've probably seen learning services. So learning services through the library, lots and lots of help on studying and learning, time management, all sorts of strategies that way. There are learning coaches, learning um, assistants that you can connect with on a weekly basis or bi-weekly just to check in to make sure you're on track with so lots of great services there. Um, wellness services. The so wellness services is the umbrella that SAS falls under, which includes counseling, health services, SAS. So um, lots of supports to our, our wellness center as well. So lots of different resources. There's lots, as I said, many offices on campus. We're all here to help. We work together and we'll do those um, referrals as we may need to. So our next step, so kind of moving on from here with regards to SAS and where you want to go, is make sure you watch your, e your email for reminders about some of our um, connecting with SAS Q&A sessions that are coming up over the summer, um, information about Start Accessible, our summer transition program. Um, as I mentioned, if you are planning to participate in that, you can move into residence early. And so there's RSVPs around that. So definitely watch your U of G email. Right? You'll also get that email that will remind you or will tell you who your advisor is and tell you to um, book an appointment. So it's important to get on that fairly early once you know who your advisor is so that um, you can connect and have that, that dialogue going. Okay? Advisors, you are assigned to an advisor and that advisor is going to stay with you for your whole academic career. Um, so they'll get to, to know you fairly well and um, make sure your um, accommodations are set and you can check in with them as you 
The other thing, I know there may be people here who I said have already completed their SAS application or already connected with us, but you're, if you're still thinking about it or you're not sure, it is a good idea to connect and request accommodations even if you're not sure. This way, you we have your information, we can direct you as necessary, um, and then if for some reason you need support, something comes up, it's better to be connected and be prepared um, for moving forward and rather than a flare up occurring and us having to go through all of the processes getting things set up. Uh, and then, like I said, the SAS events, watch for those connecting with SAS events coming up, as well as Start Accessible. Those two days at the end of the summer, students are going to be living on campus. You have the opportunity to move in early so that you can participate in those two programs, which is a great way to get settled before the hubbub of the fall happening. So before I sort of sign off, I want to say thank you for joining me um, this afternoon. If there are still questions, I'm going to hang around here, answer some questions, but you can um, reach out. So like I said, keep asking those questions in the chat. Our website is there, lots of good information on um, our SAS website. Phone number is there if you need to call as well. General inquiries about SAS, you can reach out to our SAS um, email. If it's related to the application and the documentation, SAS intake is, uh, an SAS intake at U of Guelph is um, a good resource for that. And then if it's related to our orientation or our summer programming, SAS start at U of G is an uh, email that you can reach out. Or you can just email SAS in general and then we will direct it as necessary. Quick reminder that the, um, the session on all about course selection happens at uh, four o'clock. So just keep that in mind and make sure you uh, join that for those special trips. Any questions out there still? I think we'll just we'll hang around for a few more minutes, but. Sonia and Ophelia answer those questions in the chat. And just a reminder that Guelph is a very helpful campus. We're always here to help answer questions that you may have. You just need to make sure that you ask. Tanya, there's a question. Sure, yeah. Um, a student wants to know, for Start Accessible, how would they mm -hmm. go about um, moving in early for residents? So to move in early for residents, what will happen is um, you, to participate in Start Accessible, you'll get an email and it will let you know that there's an RSVP and you just need to let us know that you are planning to participate in Start Accessible. And, um, and then we'll send you details on what that looks like. The Start Accessible programming starts on the Thursday, sort of early afternoon, and um, you'll have the opportunity to move in in the morning. We'll be connecting with housing to make sure that they know to expect you <laughs> so that you are, are ready to go. There's also some programming. Um, parents can join us on that Thursday as well. So if your parents are helping you move in, um, they can, uh, participate in that um, Thursday afternoon programming as well. So definitely a great opportunity to get familiar with campus. Um, and yeah, there's an early. Any other questions? So just as, again, one final reminder, thank you very much for joining me. I um, appreciate you 
listening to the session. I know it may have been a little overwhelming. We covered a lot of information. So feel free to um, watch the recording. It will be up on um, the Start U of G website, uh, as well as under our summer events um, site. So you can definitely um, go back and go over things. Feel free to um, reach out if you do have any questions after you've uh, digested some of the information. Reminder that the All About course selection is coming up. Course selection starts at the end of the month, 28th, 29th. So um, make sure you have a chance to get that all sorted and then you're able to, to log in and pick those courses for the fall. I know they'll probably mention this to you this afternoon as well, but um, if you're not able to get into a particular course, if it's full, it's not open, just keep trying because they do open up new sections all along um, over, over a number of different windows. So courses can change all the way up until that first week of classes. So you can always monitor um, WebAdvisor for courses that are available throughout the entire summer. Students are always making changes um, and choosing different courses, um, dropping courses, mixing them up. On um, changing different sections as they as they progress through, so kind of keeping that in mind as well. Sonia, or sorry, mm -hmm. Tanya, um, yeah. there's a question in the in the chat um, asking how do students sign sign up for Start Accessible itself? You don't actually need to sign up for Start Accessible. Um, you will get the only thing you'll get an email that will give you the dates and the times. Um, what, well, you know the dates, um, but the times, you will need to check in to start accessible when you arrive. The only thing that you'll need to um, let us know ahead of time is if you are going to be moving into residence because they want to make sure that they have all of that set. We're not going to be asking for that RSVP until probably the beginning of August after room assignments come out because right now students are learning that they, whether um, stuff from housing is coming out, letting you know if you've been um, into residence, probably ne don't necessarily know which residence you're in yet, so all of that's being sorted. Um, so yeah, usually it's in the early August that we're going to put that request out so we can let housing know you're coming. You don't need to register for, for Start Accessible. We want to keep it open so that everybody everybody can come. Right? During that time, there also there's going to be your advisor meet and greet. So if you haven't had a chance to meet with your advisor yet, that's a great opportunity to get to connect with your advisor um, during during that the program as well. The other thing during that session is there is the um, uh, exam accommodations workshop so if you are planning to or you think you might need exam accommodations so something like extra time a quiet space to write your exam those sort of things um, definitely a session that you're going to want to attend because that's going to be where you're going to learn how to book those um, accommodations and um, and access those if for some reason you're not able to make start accessible we do have um, drop-in sessions and orientation, uh, not really orientations, but workshops that happen throughout September that help to cover some of those how-tos of SIS. Um, but the draw to Start Accessible is all of those services that are connected with SIS are all together. It's the only time that you're going to get them all in the sort of same place where you can ask all of your questions all at once um, and not sort of be directed to the, the various places on campus. So it's a unique opportunity to be able to, uh, to access those. The other thing just to kind of keep in mind is we do have our SAS, I know I've mentioned it already, SAS connections um, or connecting with SAS and those take place throughout, um, first one is next Thursday, and then throughout July and August, um, where you can get questions answered specifically about SAS registering accommodations, how to access them, 
how to meet with your advisor, all of those things, details uh, more thoroughly at that point. And remember, they start U of G virtual sessions that take place over the summer as well. They're going to give you that good transition to campus life as whole. Well. And then a week, first week of uh, after Labor Day, lots of great activities and things happening that week. And that's open to all students on campus. And students that are registered with SAS are part of that bigger population with the U of G campus. Um, and so it's important to take advantage of some of those events as well. So once again, thank you for joining me today. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take a little bit of a break before the All About Courses session in about 40 minutes or so. And I hope to see you all in the fall.